Uh, my name is Chris Neal. Uh, I'm one of the organisers of the uh, Marconi exhibition. Uh, in this, the world's first wireless factory here in Chelmsford, at Hall Street. Uh, the very original factory that Marconi occupied in 1898, 14 years before the New Street factory was built, which is the one that most people are aware of in Chelmsford. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stephen Forte, giving his time here this afternoon to tell us a little bit about his experiences in the Marconi Company. 1955 to 1970, 15 years ago. It's a great time in Bristol. I really enjoyed it. So tell me then, what actually brought you to uh, the Marconi Company in the first place? Because were you from Chelmsford? No, it was my first job at the university. And I was recruited by Marconis. Uh, I was finishing my PhD at Leeds University. And uh, I applied for various jobs, and the Marconi one appeared to me, and I came here. And I've been here, I've been living here ever since. I've changed jobs, but I've been living here ever since. And what was your PhD in? Uh, electronics. It was in the subject of my thesis is a bit meaningless to me now. Network synthesis, are all very mathematical. I look at it now and I can't understand the word, although I wrote it. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But I came here, uh, Dr. Easton was running, by the way, yes, yes. And Golden Speak was his deputy. And I remember Golden Speak. The funny thing about Golden is, if you call him on the phone, he used to answer and he said, Speak! <laughs> <laughs> and he was, I'm speaking! <laughs> And it was a great time. I worked in the uh, microwave communications with uh, Wilbur Wright, John Sutherland, who became the manager of the Yes, he did. Yes. Of the radar division. It was just my immediate boss. And we had a great time. We did all sorts of things. We were working with radar. We didn't actually work on radar, but we did the transferring all the radar data from where it was picked up by the radar. Tennis, to remote points. So we did things at the farm for air show, we also had a very exciting time. So we even set up a link in uh, north of the Arctic Circle and went to testing whether it worked. Yes, right? That was very exciting. Very nice time. So that lasted several years. And then of course, when you were doing this, we were, this is really pre computers as we now know them, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So all of the signal processing and so on you were doing, well tell me, how, how were you doing the signal processing in those days? Well, digital processing was becoming available and in fact uh, when I moved from that job into the uh, microelectronics was becoming the thing and the company decided, uh, Eastwood decided it was an important subject and my colleague should be involved in it. So we set up two things. There was a semiconductor lamp in the front of the mm -hmm. And I set up a microelectronics application lab to see what we could do using these things. And one of the things we made was a little aeronautical piece of equipment for Marconi Aeronautics. And uh, it, you know, it brought us into the limelight. We gave papers on it. I even gave a lecture on it at a later conference in Washington. I think, and this goes to prove at that time, I mean, this was cutting edge stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is, you know, we were up there with anybody else absolutely. in the world. It was everybody, it, our, the Marconi Company's opportunity to grab the slice of that market. Yeah. Well, if you remember, you may have heard the Myriad computer. Certainly, yes. Well, that was made with some chips that we made. Yes. And it was my first. My sister was a program on the on the Myriad computer, uh, and that Myriad computer went into was used on a lot of the radar systems yes, for signal processing. Absolutely, that was the main process, and that was part of the thing that we built. Nobody remembers it. It started the market. It's unbelievable to me. All that just gone. Yes. So that was great. The uh, only problem was it was a great family. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, 
problem with my cut and didn't pay thank you. No. So in the end... What have you done your job? Oh, it's small, didn't you? Had a big, big oh, tiny job. She was getting jobs and I went to work for the uh, company. <coughs> but uh, it took me a long time. To <laughs> yeah, my, my, my cut. Yeah. Yes. In the blood, you know, yes. 15 years, it's a long time. That's right. And I don't, I think as being a Marconi uh, engineer or somebody in the Marconi company was a massive qualification for getting a job somewhere else. I mean, Marconi people would have been welcomed anywhere in the world. And it wasn't difficult to pay them more than Marconi's paid them, was it? No, no, no. no. Everywhere I went, all the different companies, there was all the somebody on being a Yes. Either whether they were customers, making equipment, or people in the same business. It was, a, it was the birthplace of Rick Thomas. And it sprung a lot of money. It was a great shame. I mean, when you look back, I mean, we're running a film here that was made in 1970 in New Street, uh, and you can see the amazing breadth of businesses that Mark Henry was in at that time. And as you said, it included microelectronics. Oh. Many people now probably don't remember that Marconi was in microelectronics right at the beginning. And indeed, as you say, it started off with development work going on at Bado, uh, ultimately then moving across to Whitton. And you can probably tell us a little bit about that story. Well, I remember the first chip that we made. I was so proud of it. And it was eight bit shift Eight bits. Now what we're talking today about terabyte bytes, you know. <laughs> yes. This was, and we were so proud of that. It was, it was a great advance. Uh, and it obviously somebody decided to invest a bit more money and we said that was factory. Great factory. Whittem. Moved to Whitton, brand new factory, a beautiful factory. Uh, and we started to manufacture products there. We went to Whitton, uh, made chips for I'm going to talk to you one of the customers, the aeronautical division. We made chips for all sorts of things. Really? It's called. I mean, they would never have thought it was possible because it could be small and use no power. So you could put these chips into all sorts of space. The other thing I remember about Whitton is that across the street from my factory was a factory that made uh, fruit flavorings, totally artificial fruit flavorings. Okay. And you could smell it in our factory. Yes. And if the flavor of the wheat was strawberry, None of them affected the yield in our products. I can't remember much. <laughs> Whatever the chemicals was, we had to actually stop. Yeah. High tech stuff. Subsequent to the electronics business being there, EEV took over that very same factory and made TWTs in that building. And um, there was always a concern about the cathodes in vacuum tubes easily being uh, damaged by contaminants. So we had exactly that same worry uh, about the, um, the strawberries or whatever it was. So getting a strawberry flavoured cathode was never going to work quite so well. Talking about, talking about TWTs, it takes me right back to my days in Baden because there was early uses of your TWTs yes. in, the, in the microwave. Links. So I made I remember going up to a big town in Bando, setting up the pieces of the and we had we did uh, uh, a link all the way off the east coast across all the rail stations and so make all the rail stations on the east coast. And it was using the TWTs. In fact uh, he asked me this picture, I found a picture of me with one of my colleagues. With a rack with some of it. So just going, going back to the microelectronics factory, what, what was your role within that factory? Well, I was running the applications engineering department. And then, uh, <coughs> so the, actually the use of the product as opposed to the actual making of the chips. So I had a bunch of engineers and 
new, new applications, talk to customers, design the product to suit the customers. And then from then on, I moved into marketing. And then I was put on by the making company, which I joined the office. Well, what happened actually was we moved Marconi Mock Elliot to the Marconi Elliot. And the Elliot people didn't like it and they left. And they set up a rival company from the Labour Ministry. And they recruited one of my guy as marketing director. And eventually, the company was so this was in, so you were then based, as you say, in Glen Rothes. Uh, and so that was a semiconductor plant. No, it was a plant. It was a game, yeah, semiconductor plant. Doing the same thing, designing, but not manufacturing. Uh, the manufacturing was done in the States. All right. General Institute of GI. Another company. I finished that company in Holland. I've been holding for 10 years. It's interesting because I had engineering teams working for me in Baden, in Britain, in Berlin, uh, in, in Germany, in Holland. And I've got to say that in my Dutch friends here, we have the best by far with the Dutch. We were the most professional, the most so subsequent to you working in Marconi's, in the various companies that you subsequently worked for, ran, did you actually then do business with Marconi? Indeed, yes. I remember going back to Marconi Bazaar to, to do business. Going back in there, and they hadn't changed. They were the same color, the green and the cream walls. <laughs> uh, the only difference was it was allowed to park. It was not just <laughs> time. <laughs> so it was stiff. And I, I remember seeing one of my colleagues started with me the same day. And he was still working on the same desk, in the same office. And 20, you know, it's great. Things don't change much now. But it's a great place. Well, I mean, you know, the Battle Lab did all sorts of very clever things. Antennas, radar, of course. Dr. Eastwood, by the way, who was a he was fascinated by birds. And he made use of the fact that we had all the said I couldn't go and push again. And he asked to turn your books. Had to go spend the night tracking these damn birds, flocks of all starlings, you know, all this murmuration of stuff. He was the first guy to notice that. Yes, yes. He actually got his FRS best scan. Yes. Uh, well, I, I can remember um, as a youngster. Um, because as we've spoken about earlier, my father was Marconi Reza uh, and worked for Eric Eastwood. Uh, and I remember, I don't know whether you would have been there at that time, but Eric Eastwood did a talk at the Chelmsford Civic Theatre. Uh, absolutely, I still remember it to this day. And of course, part of that talk included all the radar imagery that they'd taken of the birds from, uh, from Bushy Hill. But it's probably worth you talking about Bushy Hill, because in the various people we've talked to in this exhibition and their own experiences at Marconi, I actually don't think we've had anybody talking about Bushy. So did you go and visit Bushy? Did you do anything at Bushy yourself? Well, no, I mean, we just went and spent... We had set up equipment there, and we were working on behalf of Eric Eastwood, tracking yes. these birds. And uh, coming home, I remember one interesting thing where he was in my home on my phone, I was very tired, and I fell asleep and driving those back roads. The next thing I knew, I'd gone into a ditch, out of the ditch, into this wire fence, into this field. So I got out, put the rest of the fence down, drove into the field, and came out of the field. Must be seen by the farmers, <laughs> see a car coming out of their gate. I did a lot of damage to my car. Experience. Yes. Uh, I have an earlier memory of Bushy Hill because um, as a small child and my father would go up and want to go and tinker with one of the uh, radar sets at the top of the hill on a Saturday and I'd be sat in the car 
that he went up there just to check that the tests were going fine or something like that. So I was actually quite young the first time I went up to uh, to push it. Yeah, I wasn't there. Was uh, I mean, your father my age? So. My father was born in uh, twen 1920. Oh no, he's older. So he's older. I was born in Yeah. So yes. But, uh, yeah, but I remember. I remember. You know, when you said me. Yes. <laughs> I remember bad immediately. So which, I remember first. Yeah. So which other bit? So. So Pado and um, Pado and, Whit and Whitton were really your two main places. Well, I worked a bit of Rittle. You know, oh, yeah, come tell us about Rittle because obviously um, part of the theme, part of the theme um, here, is, as you'll know, is that we're doing this jointly with BBC Essex, and of course BBC Essex are celebrating their 30th anniversary. But of course, what we want to talk about as well is the very early days of broadcasting. Yeah, then Nellie Melbourne in uh, New Street, but then subsequently, of course, well, Nellie Melba did her, um, her piece at New Street. Yes, she did. Everybody always told me that she did that first thing from the past of it. No, we'll, you'll, we'll show you some pictures in a minute okay. around the corner. She, <clears throat> she did it in um, New Street, but of course Rittle was actually where they did most of the rest of the broadcasting at 2 Emma Top, 2 Emma T. Um, but I guess when Dame Nellie Mel came, she didn't want to be too far from the railway station, so they set the broadcast studio up in New Street. But tell us about Rittle, because that was where they were doing the aviation. No, aviation was basic. Okay, subsequently it was. So tell, tell us about the little in your time. Communications. So it was the other half of what we were doing. And uh, they did uh, many com uh, radio communications, wireless communications. And of course we were heavily into microwave communications. So going in C band X-Men stuff, like on the wave guides, I remember joining the wave guides together, climbing up that tower, putting in the tennis and all that. I remember going up, you know that big tower, that uh, I do. Yeah. That tower is the old CH yeah, tower from Canute. Yes, 360 feet high. Yeah. 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 Oh, gosh. Uh, there's a platform on the 150 feet, and there's a platform at 200 feet. I went up to the corner and they had wooden ladders so to walk up this ladder. So it moved up and down, not very comfortable. And he absolutely floored the cat. And he got half the ladder, so he took us an hour and half. So he couldn't go up. The other thing I remember was I was in my lab in the back of the room. I see the car. I had a big thunderstorm and the lightning hit it. There was a flash of lightning. I think the metal would be a good conjunction. It was arced across from the 250 to the 150. Oh, and it was So that was a, short, a shorter route than going through the metal. Yeah, through the metal. Yeah, yeah, I can't it. did. Unbelievable. I'm glad I wasn't on it at the time. <laughs> And of course, when you're that close, the flash and bang are simultaneous, oh, yeah, aren't they? So you know you're close. Yeah, yeah. No, no doubt about it whatsoever. It's still there. Uh, the tower is still there. Um, well, I mean, I guess that's going to be the next big challenge one of these days because it's, um, you know, obviously it'll be going gently rusty while it's standing there, and at some point somebody's going to say, something has to be done so i guess that's going to be a battle in another one in due course because that yeah, you know, has got to be a Canute. major landmark you, you remember can you yeah i've been there as well yeah we set up a quick place so when you went to canoe was it were the three ch towers still there then, no no that time? Already it was okay. Okay. Yeah. bring me back memories of them you've gone <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes. Well, it's a long time ago, and a lot of things have happened since. But that was absolutely wonderful. And I said I came to Chelsea because of Marco. Yes. And when I joined GI, 
uh, I had an office in London, and the fact that it's just stayed in Chatham, mm. and when I joined them, my next American company, I lived in the States, but I kept my home here because my kids were here, they yes. went to school. Yes. So I never lived, I never left, I was yes. still here, and I was still living there. Yes. But, uh, so it's a whole time. And of course, quite a few other um, Marco, old Marconi employees are in Danbury and, uh, and local to you. Oh yes, I know my neighbour who is not Marconi, he's always got to play to you. All the damn Marconi people all around me. The fellow, the person who's opposite me, was Ellis Robinson. Yeah, oh yes. Yeah, he was my neighbour. He was a great captain. Yeah, Ellis Robinson, I remember again, because my father worked with Ellis Robinson, um, was one of the was the first person I'd ever met who actually installed a heat pump yes. to a uh, ground, ground source heat pump in his garden um, with all the um, pipe work under his back lawn, yeah. which was great for the year one and two. And by year three, he had permafrost, and then it opened up big voids around it, and the whole thing was useless. But I also remember you could see this. The coils on top of that are really doing white, yes. you know, when the floors Yeah, the yeah, permafrost. Yeah. The other thing I remember about this shop and so is he took a cut his lawn, and it was a damn lawnmower, his lawn shorts with a gold cigarette. Yes, oh, yes. It was very posh, dry cutting his lawn. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of characters. Uh, and other ones that were in uh, in Bado. I mean, you, you were telling me uh, you knew Mike Mandel. You know Mike Mandel. Um, I mean, I knew him as MD of um, EV, of course, but you knew him well, he was also... in the days when he was at Whitton. Well, before that, I knew him because he was my neighbour when I lived on the Marconi okay. estate. Oh, yes, yes. He lived across the street from me. Talk about the Marconi estate again. I mean, that's a major institution back in the in the 50s wasn't it and presumably was that on offer to you when you were recruited by Marconi? No, no, no. Because when I first came down here I actually lived in, in Haywood on the farm on the flat there and then uh, John Suffolk lived in Marconi and he bought his own house and he arranged for me to take over from him so that was uh, all boys network. Is that generally then how it works by that time? Well, no, you applied for it, and you know, there was a long waiting list. And I had one of them, there were several classes, and he had a big one, and he had a nice big one, and nice big one. I remember that, that was just, uh, I don't know what's happening there. Yes. No, I don't. A another person that I remember that was there was Colin Latham, he was on the market yeah, the estate. Yes, and another of my colleagues, Pat Sargent, who used to be here. Yes. So, so, I mean, that was quite a community, wasn't it? Outside was it with Marconi and Evie? Yes. Because uh, Mike Mandel was at the EV then. Right. So there were EV people as well as Marconi. I'll tell you another thing about you, if you remember, because uh, uh, Mr. Young. Oh, uh, yes. Jim, 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 Young. Jim Young, yes. Became the chairman of uh, Marconi Makeup uh, Marconi Makeup Marconi Makeup Marconi Makeup Marconi Makeup And he was a very different guy. And I remember going to talk to him when I was running. I was running the MOS there as a person with a bike forward to talk And I used to go and ask him. And he had three answers to any questions he had. One of them was, I've heard it all before. <laughs> uh, the other one was, it's exactly the same with chicks. And I also remember his finance, I can't remember his name, his finance director. Uh, and uh, came to see us in that with him before Mr. Young arrived. And Mr. Young hated the suede shoes. And one of my colleagues, our finance guy, wasn't there. He looked at me, he was at the car park. And Mr. Young's finance guy said, I was not changing his shoes. I said, what do you mean? So he told me, I told us about the switch. So of course, we followed with everybody in Whitton came in switch. <laughs> <laughs> incredible. But the other thing, I remember we had a traffic canteen, the, the management dining room. 
Are we talking about Waterhouse? Yes, you're talking about the time. Waterhouse, yeah, yeah. And Mr. Young used to come there, and everybody stood until he sat down, and all of the sharing, and he carved a incredible um, that You're talking about my early days in um, EEV. EEV. You weren't allowed in there. Um, well, my first time I went in there was, did you know Bob Coulson? Oh yeah, I remember Bob Coulson very well. Well, Bob Coulson became the MD yes, of, of yeah. EEV, uh, and I was a, a young engineer in EEV, and I one day got a phone call from uh, Bob Coulson's secretary, and uh, and I was told, um, you've been invited to join Mr. Coulson for lunch today. So um, there I was. I went into the, in, into the tide, but... Well, I'm not sure whether Bob Coulson had a problem with suede shoes. I don't know whether he <laughs> no, no, it was. It was, it was not a problem. And um, so that's what I did. There I am, a young engineer. And um, did he do the carving as well? This is the question. This is the point. Part of the initiation in those days into management was that you had to go to the top table. He then we had some other visitors there. Uh, and your job was to carve the joint. Oh, your joint. Job? Oh, yeah. So my job was to carve the joint. So wow. the first test <laughs> that I had was could I carve a joint of beef? Did you pass? I did. Well, in my days, it was Mr. Young. Nobody, nobody else was allowed here. Did you have sherry as well before? Uh, well, in those days, yes, there was sherry and there was a barrel of beer and so on. I mean, it's, it's quite unbelievable now when you think back. Um, but there we are, that was how it was. Things have changed, I don't think for the better. No. I mean, in those days, and I think it was just the same in Marconi if you're in New Street, I think there were probably four layers of dining arrangements. You had the very, very discreet director's dining room, and you then had senior management. Then you had a waitress service, and then you had a self service, and that's what we had in Walter House. And as I say, I suspect it was just the same in New Street. I'm not sure about Maddo, though. No, Maddo had two. I'll tell you another memory I have now, just keep back to you. Uh, I decided to leave my company because I was having trouble with my boss. And I got called up by Lord Telford through his office. And he actually asked me to stay. At that time, I was in a hard time. I quit to resign and accepted the job. And I was in a big personal problem because my wife had just left me and I was left with two kids. No way. I was had to move to a new town. I didn't know how I was going to cope. And Telford actually asked me to stay. If you know, I would have begged him to take me back. But he asked yes. me to stay, he even gave me a raise. <laughs> yes. It's incredible. So these things happen. He was a charm man. He was a charm man. I don't, I, I don't think I ever met Bob Telford, but obviously no, by, by name. And another thing, when I left the second time, I lived in that And Mr. Young called me to his office. And he told me he was sorry to see me go. And wish me luck. And he told me that my pension kept open for me for two years in case I decided to leave. Yeah. yeah, nobody could imagine anybody going to leave. No, that's the point. They didn't really they didn't. have a way of handling it. No, they couldn't. And uh, Dr. Thompson, who was the... Oh, uh, yes, uh, yes. And I remember him. He called me to his office to my uh, left. And you know, his counsel said I was leaving. And I went and I had three months notice of the He said, you can't go and work with him. Yeah, I remember him. You know, I'm not going to steal him. You're not allowed in the factory. So I said, okay. It's pay me and I'll leave it. Okay, so I tell you, go down on your leg. But I cried all the way to the back. <laughs> yes, well. It was a different world. It was. Totally different. It was. Very, very different world.
when we were setting up this exhibition, people said, oh, we ought to go and get um, all the old Marconi employees to make a, uh, a, a big contribution to, to acquiring this Hall Street building. Uh, and I, I can't try and remind people, I said, nobody ever worked at Marconi's to get rich. People only worked at Marconi's because they enjoyed it. So that is not going to be a source of, um, a source of funds for acquiring this fact, if this works. How much do we want? Yeah, well, I thought it was going to finish that. What we sought to raise last year when we went for crowdfunding was £380,000 for a 99-year lease. Um, so we did a, um, a, a crowdfunding exercise with uh, um, Space Hive. We get 10 weeks to raise the money. And uh, in the 10 weeks, we did raise £20,000. Um, but of course, that's all small pledges. So it's a lot of people with faith in what we're trying to do. Many people are not involved in this Well, I mean, what Marconi are we talking about? You know, this is the problem now, isn't it? We were saying, where's it all gone? Well, some, of, some of it went to PA system, some of it, Ericsson hold the name, uh, and of course, Finn Mechanica um, which, uh, have uh, some of the business as well. Um, but, you know, it's obviously got diluted down a heck of a lot since the days of Boswell. Italiana as well, Mr. Of course, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But Finn Mechanica, I mind. But you know, obviously Bologna had to do it today. Yes, well, that's the uh, that's the Marconi Museum, the Foundation yeah. Guillermo Marconi yeah. in uh, Bologna. Yeah. They've been very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we. I think our tapes are running out. Yeah, we're out of ideas. Uh, water. <laughs> Great, yeah. okay. okay. Well, could you conclude by saying thank you so much? Oh, yeah, we'll do that. You can, <laughs> just a minute, I'll get a wide shot. And then... Um, That's it, well, when this guy moves... I don't need to hug or anything. We're English, please remember. Uh, I'm the only foreigner here. Same as me. Half Greek. Same, half Italian. Egypt. I've been baptised in Egypt. I was born, born in Egypt. Egypt. What about that? Oh, you haven't got that link. No, I haven't. No, no, no. I the only thing you've got is a mummy, and <laughs> we've all got there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was bad. Oh dear, that was shocking, wasn't it?